All right, so let's start. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Josef Schiem. I'm president of Tevro Institute, small elite private college here in the very downtown of Prague. And this event is a Tevro Institute Academic Forum, a public talk series featuring top scholars and policy experts from all over the world, the series which we started two years ago. And we already welcome here very famous, influential people such as Professor Richard Epstein of University of Chicago or Professor Peter Betke of George Mason University or a few weeks ago uh, Professor David Schmitz from University of Arizona. They covered all kind of issues connected to uh, policy debates. Uh, today we will debate a hot issue of economic policy, namely taxation. And actually it is not a coincidence. Uh, our school, which started six years ago as a new college offering BA in political science and public administration, is expanding into economic field. After getting accreditation in law in business relations, the first step toward moving uh, to private law and business, we made a very substantial further progress in this direction. And I'm, I'm announcing it for the first time now. Several Institute obtained accreditation to offer BA program in economic policy. And first students will start studying economics here in the fall. Uh, that step completed, completed the general profile of our school. That is, our students can study law, both public and private, political science and international relations, and now, newly, uh, economic policy. All this in a very interesting overlap of sciences, and all of this in this family-like environment which uh, our great facility offers. Today it is my great honor to introduce to you Dr. Daniel Mitchell. Uh, Dan is a top expert on tax reform and supply side tax policy, working for the Cato Institute, famous and influential Washington DC based think tank. Um, Dr. Mitchell is a world famous advocate of a flat tax and international tax competition which is documented among other outlets in his book Global Tax Revolution, The Rise of Tax Competition and the Battle to Defend It, published by the Cato Institute in 2008. Prior to joining Cato Institute, Dr. Mitchell was a senior fellow with the Heritage Foundation. He's a very active speaker and writer. His articles can be found in such publications as the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Investors Business Daily, and Washington Times. He's a frequent guest on radio and television. Dr. Mitchell holds bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from the University of Georgia and a PhD in economics from George Mason University. I look forward very much to today's debate. As you know, uh, the flat tax which got established here is on, on a very uh, strong defensive. And I'll, I'm very, I look forward very much to, one, to the, a great defender of flat tax, Dan Mitchell, to talk us about reasons why we should stick to it. So then the floor is now yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I have a personal stake in this. Uh, when I try to educate American lawmakers about tax reform and why we should get rid of our tax system and go with a flat tax, I always talk about all the countries around the world that have done this and have been successful with it. And uh, I don't want the Czech Republic to undo their flat tax because then I'll have one less country to talk about. Uh, and that would be uh, unfortunate because we want to create some momentum for better policy. Uh, I think in terms of uh, organizing my remarks, 
I want to start by first talking about overall fiscal policy because this ties in directly to why the flat tax is under assault in the Czech Republic. If you have a big government with a huge welfare state and a crippling burden of government spending, it's very difficult to have good tax policy. Uh, and if you look at why there is so much trouble in Europe right now, why countries like the Czech Republic, but also Slovakia, uh, that are looking at getting rid of their flat tax, it's because the size of government is too big, and because of the fiscal crisis and the economic weakness, uh, what happens when your economy gets weak, there's less income to tax, politicians begin to get all worried, oh, we don't have enough money, uh, and especially when that gets mixed in with class warfare, uh, uh, political uh, discussions, uh, then the flat tax comes under assault. Uh, and if I was to identify one good rule of fiscal policy that every country should try to follow that puts them in a very strong position uh, for good tax policy in the long run, that rule is that the private sector should always grow faster than the government. Now, why do I say that? I say that because what is the private sector? The private sector is taxable income. So if the private sector is growing, say, 5% a year, that means that your taxable income is probably growing 5% a year. Uh, and if you have your government grow 2% or 3% a year, then your fiscal policy is obviously in very, very strong shape because your revenues are going to be coming in above your spending and there's not going to be pressure to implement bad tax policy. If the Czech Republic, if Slovakia, for that matter, if Germany, England, the United States, if every country around the world followed that good rule of having the private sector grow faster than the government, or you could say it a different way, the government should grow slower than the private sector, same thing. That is really the key to good fiscal policy. If you do it the wrong way, if government grows faster than the private sector, sooner or later, you become Greece. It's just a mathematical certainty. Depending on the lines, it may take you 50 years, 100 years to become Greece. It might take you two or three years to become Greece. But if you have the government growing faster than the private sector, that is a very bad recipe. And that is why the flat tax uh, is in trouble in the Czech Republic, in trouble in Slovakia, and in a few other countries. Now, with that in mind, I now want to move from sort of just government fiscal policy to economic growth, because this is another issue that I think is very critical when we're talking about tax reform. And I'm going to start by saying fiscal policy isn't everything. I'm a fiscal policy economist, so sometimes I like to think that's the most important thing in the world. But of course, there are lots of other policies that matter. Rule of law, property rights, monetary policy, trade policy, regulation. If you look at things like the Economic Freedom of the World Index from the Fraser Institute, or the Index of Economic Freedom from the Heritage Foundation, they have all these different measures when they're trying to determine how competitive a country is, whether they have good policy, how fast they're going to grow. So when I'm talking about fiscal policy, and when I'm actually narrowly talking about the flat tax, that's just one slice of a pie. You want your whole pie to be good. You, you don't want your know, poison to be in part of your pie because then when you eat the wrong slice, you wind up in trouble and you wind up being sick. So if a country has very good tax policy, very good regulatory policy, but then their monetary policy is very bad, you can still wind up having a sick economy. So I'm going to be talking about why it's so important to have a flat tax. But keep in your mind that even if you have a flat tax, it's not going to help you if your government is too big. That's part of fiscal policy. And it's not going to help you if you have all these other policies uh, that are very, very wrong. Uh, so it's, it's all about the context. The flat tax is, a, is an important consideration for having a faster growing economy, but it's not the only consideration. And so sometimes when people look around the world, they see a country like, say, Ukraine that has a flat tax, but Ukraine isn't doing very well economically. Well, if you look at the Economic Freedom of the World Index, Ukraine has a very low score because they're doing so many other things wrong. You really have to try to do good policies in all sorts of areas if you want to get very positive results. But if you do that, if you do that, let's think about what it means economically. If you take a country that only grows 1% a year, 
It takes 70 years for that country to double its GDP. Think of Italy, almost no growth. If Italy grows for the next 70 years at 1% a year, that's how long it will take, 70 years, a full lifetime uh, for, for GDP to double. And that's just doubling GDP in, in nominal terms. You know, what, what it would mean for per capita GDP, probably not as good. On the other hand, if you have an economy that grows 7% a year, you double your GDP in just 10 years. Uh, now, you know, th that's an extreme example, 1% versus 7%. Uh, but in the U.S., I sometimes cite these two examples that I think underscore how important it is to try to figure out ways to get your economy to grow faster. In the U.S., if we could increase our economic growth rate by just two-tenths of one percent, let's say we went from three percent growth to 3.2 percent growth, by the time you go out 25 years, you're talking about an additional four to five thousand dollars of income for the average household. So even small differences in economic growth, when you compound them over a couple of decades, really do make a difference in people's lives. So, so you know, sometimes when I talk to people and they think, well, okay, if we did a flat tax or not do a flat tax, it might not make that much difference. Maybe the economy would only grow half a percent faster. Half a percent faster. Well, if you're planning on dying next year, maybe you wouldn't notice. But hopefully you're not planning on dying next year. If you're going to be around in 20 or 25 years, that one half of 1% additional growth would make a lot of difference. The other example I cite in the U.S. is uh, if we went back to, say, 1900, what, 112 years ago, and you took the actual growth rate America had and simply reduced it by one percentage point each year, America today would be as poor as Mexico. So 1% growth may not sound like much, but over 100 years, uh, it, it's the difference between being a poor country and being a rich country. So yes, it is important to try to figure out the policies that will enable more economic growth. It is important to try to figure out how to remove the, the impediments that government puts in the way. And again, yes, I want to stress, Flat tax is not the only thing in fiscal policy, and fiscal policy is not the only thing that matters for growth, but it is very important, and it's very important for one critical reason. We now live in a competitive global economy. It is very easy for investors, for entrepreneurs, for companies to, to, to very quickly look around the world and decide where are we going to put this new factory where are we going to make this new investment? Where are we going to create this new job? Forty years ago, fifty years ago, before globalization, uh, countries could sometimes get away with having bad tax law. They could, tax, they could have very high tax rates, and they didn't have to worry about people shifting their money, shifting their investments, companies shifting their jobs across national borders. Now that's very important. Uh, if you look at the data uh, from a well, it doesn't matter whether you look at U.S. government data, IMF data, you look at the data about the increase in cross-border investment, especially since about 1980, it's been enormous. And, and in some sense, my message would be that what the flat tax does is it, is it sends a signal for a country. It sends a signal to the world's investors, to the world's job creators, to the companies, to the entrepreneurs, we have a tax system that is designed not to punish you for creating wealth inside our borders. Uh, it's sort of like putting a we're open for business sign uh, on, uh, on the Czech Republic's uh, uh, advertising slogan. Uh, we want you to come here and create growth. Now, on the other hand, if the Czech Republic was to, to go back to a discriminatory tax system, that punishes people for creating more growth, more jobs, more wealth for the Czech economy, that would be a big mistake. Because again, you have all these places out there where people can create jobs and to make investments. People, if they want to focus just on low wages, they can go to some place like China or India. If they want to get the benefits of a flat tax, there are about 15 other jurisdictions, uh, a lot of them locally, uh, that have flat tax systems. You know, just because Slovakia and the Czech Republic are thinking about making this mistake, 
That doesn't mean that Romania and Bulgaria and uh, the Baltic countries, lots of other places have a flat tax. And you better believe that if the Czech Republic gets rid of its flat tax, the people who are in charge of promoting investment in places like Estonia are going to go to companies, they're going to go to the investors, to the job creators, the entrepreneurs, and they're going to say, we have not betrayed you. We have not put in a system that punishes you for earning more income and creating more wealth. It would be a major, major mistake in terms of the Czech Republic's marketing and position in the world, in terms of attracting that productive, uh, uh, the productive resources from the entrepreneurs and the investors. But, but let me go ahead and back up and just emphasize the key principles of what makes a good tax system so we understand exactly why a flat tax is important. Uh, because sometimes, as I deal with this all the time when I'm talking to American politicians, they think a flat tax is just one rate. And yes, that's part of it. A flat tax has a single rate. But it also has, at least it should have, a low rate. Sometimes we joke in America that President Obama has a very simple tax reform plan. It's only going to have two lines. Right now we have 72,000 pages of tax law one of the worst, most complicated systems in the world. And you know, one of the reasons we talk about a flat tax is we want to make that American tax system simple and clean. But we have a joke. We have a joke that President Obama has a very simple tax uh, reform plan where he's going to get rid of those 72,000 pages of tax law and have a simple tax system with only two lines. You know, instead of all these different tax forms to fill out on tax day, you'd only have two lines. What did you make last year? send it to the government. So that obviously wouldn't be the right idea of tax reform. That would be a 100% tax rate. The flat tax, it's one rate, but it's also a very low rate. And why do you want a low tax rate? Because the tax is the price. It's the price that government is imposing on whatever's being taxed. And American politicians at least understand that when they want to. Because American politicians all the time are saying, we need higher taxes on tobacco because we want people to smoke fewer cigarettes. Now, I don't think it's government's job to control people's private lives, but I do give those politicians a good grade for understanding economics because they understand the higher the tax on something, the less you get of it. Well, what's a flat tax? The idea of a flat tax is you want a low tax rate on work, entrepreneurship, productive behavior. You want a low tax rate because with the case of an income tax, what you're taxing is the generation of income. And, you know, and, and remember, what's good for an economy is investment income production. If we want the benefits of all that, the consumption, we first have to produce the income. The, the former socialist uh, president of Brazil, uh, President Lula, uh, some of his left-wingers in his own party were upset with him because he was lowering some tax rates and things like that. And he said, you don't understand. If people don't first produce, there's nothing to redistribute. So, you know, I don't think there should be a lot of redistribution, but at least as a left-winger, he understood that if nobody's producing anything, there's nothing to redistribute. And so, yes, you want a low tax rate because you want more production, more income in your economy. But you also want to make sure you don't double tax certain things. This is a big problem in the U.S. I don't know how big of a problem it is in the Czech Republic, but in the U.S., uh, between the capital gains tax, the corporate income tax, the double tax on dividends, and the death tax, a single dollar of income in the U.S. can be taxed by the IRS four different times. Now let's think about this. Every single economic theory even socialism and Marxism, every single economic theory agrees that you have to have saving and investment to have economic growth. People have to set aside some of today's income to finance tomorrow's prosperity. And yet, in, in the U.S. at least, for the people who save and invest because they're rich people and therefore, I guess they're bad or something, uh, because they're rich people, we tax them again and again and again. 
And then we wonder why people don't save and invest enough. So yes, you want a low tax rate. That's very important because that's the price that government's imposing on something. But you also want to get rid of the double taxation so government is only taxing income one time. And then sort of the third part of tax reform is you want to get rid of all the loopholes. You want to get rid of all the loopholes for two simple reasons. First reason, the fewer the loopholes you have, the lower your tax rate can be. If the government's going to demand this much money and, and, uh, and you decide to, to exempt half of the income in your economy from tax, then you obviously have to have a tax rate that's twice as high. Whereas if you tax all the income in the economy, then you can have a tax rate that's very low and very reasonable. Now, almost every country with a flat tax has a, a, a certain amount of what we call in America a zero bracket amount or tax-free income. So you're not taxing the poor. Um, but the idea is, okay, don't tax the poor perhaps. Have, a, have, a, have an exempt amount, a tax-free amount, a zero bracket amount, but then tax all the income above that level at a low rate. Don't put in special loopholes for farmers. Don't put in special loopholes for manufacturers. Don't put in special loopholes for whoever happens to go to a politician with a big pile of money from some special interest group. So keep the tax rate low by avoiding the loopholes. But then another benefit of that is that you're taking away, I guess I'll call it the corruption in the political system. When, when you allow politicians to put loopholes in the tax system, you are giving politicians a license to get special favors from the different interest groups and industries, usually, in the, at least in America, in the form of campaign contributions. We don't call them bribes, we call them campaign contributions. Uh, and then the politicians, you know, why do we have those 72,000 pages? <laughs> because in those 72,000 pages, there are probably, you know, 72,000 different exemptions and loopholes, or maybe there's three times 72,000. Uh, that's very complicated math, so I'll let, I'll let Joseph figure that out. But uh, uh, you know, our system is very corrupt and very inefficient because you have politicians engaging in industrial policy through the tax code. And what happens, and this, this is why I want to bring it back to the importance in the Czech Republic of not putting in additional tax rates. What happens when you start putting in higher tax rates? Well, if you're a certain industry, if you're a certain sector of the economy and you're seeing these higher tax rates, you have a bigger incentive to then go to the politicians and say, the tax rate is so high, give me a special exemption. Give me a preference, give me a loophole, give me a deduction, a credit, an exclusion. If the tax rate is low, and the Czech Republic you know, has a relatively decent tax rate for your flat tax. If your tax rate is low, for the most part, people aren't going to be too upset about it. Yeah, no one likes paying taxes, but if you have a reasonably low tax rate, uh, people aren't, go aren't going to complain too much about it, but more importantly, they're not going to go to the politicians and say, here, we're going to give you a lot of money in exchange for a loophole, because the rate is low enough that it's not worth it to give the politicians a bunch of money in order to get a special preference in the tax code. But if you start putting in new higher tax rates, I mean, let's do a little bit of math experiment. Uh, this is the way I always I describe it to American politicians. Uh, if you have a 50% tax rate and you can get a special loophole, you're saving 50 cents on every dollar you earn. But on the other hand, if you reduce the tax rate down to 20%, uh, and you put in a loophole, you're only saving 20 cents on the dollar. It's just not worth it as much. So keeping the tax rate low, keeping the tax rate flat is a way of keeping the corruption out of the tax system. That's very important. If the Czech Republic gets rid of the flat tax, then every industry, every sector of the economy that is affected by the higher tax rate is going to start worrying about getting loopholes. It's, it's sort of, you know, you can have a virtuous cycle, low rates leading to better policy, leading to better growth and more prosperity, or you can have higher tax rates leading to more loopholes, leading to more favoritism, more corruption. Keep the tax rate as low as possible. That is so important. Now, one thing that I always get, and I'm sure it's the big issue here in the Czech Republic because it's the big issue in tax policy in the U.S. The politicians are always worried whether they're going to have enough money. Now, at the very beginning of my talk, I sort of explained 
the most important thing is to keep the growth of government spending under control. You keep the growth of government spending under control and this never gets to be a problem. But of course, as we say in America, the horse already got out of the barn. Countries have high deficits and debt, government spending increased too much, and now they're worried, they're sort of like looking around, where can we get some money because, because we're not satisfying the Maastricht criteria, and now there's this new EU fiscal constitution where we're supposed to have deficits of only a half a percent of GDP, and oh my goodness, we need more money, what are we going to do? Politicians need to understand that higher tax rates don't automatically mean more tax revenue. Think about it this way. Imagine that you were running a restaurant. And I'm an American, so let's say you're running a McDonald's. We call it the American Embassy when we're overseas. So you're running a McDonald's restaurant. And you're thinking, well, gee, this is a pretty good McDonald's restaurant. You know, a lot of people are coming through, and I'm getting 100,000, uh, whatever, however you say your kroner, is it? Is that how you say it, kroner? Uh, I'm getting 100,000 kroner uh, you know, every week or month or year or whatever it is. And you're thinking, well, hey, I want more money. I'm going to double all my prices because that way I'll get 200,000 kroner. Now, if you had any sense you would immediately say, wait a second, if I double all my prices, I bet instead of going to McDonald's, people might start going to other restaurants because if I'm doubling the price of my hamburgers, if I'm doubling the price of my french fries, if I'm doubling the price of my Coca-Cola, maybe people won't buy as much from me. And therefore, instead of gaining an extra 100,000 kroner, maybe I'll only gain 50,000 or 20,000, or maybe if enough people decide not to shop at my restaurant, maybe I'll actually lose money. That, if you take that common sense, logical understanding of the world and apply it to fiscal policy, what do you get? You get something called the Laffer Curve. And I want to cite you a real world example from the US. When Ronald Reagan became president in 1980, we had a 70% top tax rate. That was terrible. I mean, we were the socialists back then. 70% top tax rate. Now, if you look at the rich people in America, and you know, the usual thing in America is you define rich as $200,000 a year or above in income. Well, in 1980, and this is right out of the IRS Statistics of Income publications, in 1980, with a top tax rate of 70%, Rich people in America paid $19 billion of tax to the IRS. Reagan took that 70% top tax rate and he lowered it all the way to 28%. Still far too high, but obviously a lot better than, 20, than 70. And a lot of the left wingers in America said, oh, this is unfair. Rich people won't pay enough. The government will be starved of revenue. Uh, oh, the world's going to come to an end. You know, you, you, the most, the most ridiculous accusations were made that Reagan's ta tax rate reductions were going to be very bad for the U.S. What happened? Rich people declared 10 times as much income to the government, and as a result, the government got five times as much revenue. Instead of getting $19 billion a year in 1980 with a 70% rate, they got $99 billion in 1988 with a 28% tax rate five times as much revenue, even though the tax rate came down like this. Now, that's a dramatic example, 70 to 28. Uh, you know, I'm not even sure what the government in the Czech Republic is talking about, how high they want the tax rate to, to go up. But here's one thing I can guarantee. It's not a simple, linear, mathematical equation. If the government is increasing the tax rate by 20%, they're not going to get 20% more revenue. If they're increasing the tax rate by 30%, they're not going to get 30% more revenue. As a matter of fact, I can guarantee you, the bigger the increase, the farther they'll fall from their estimate of what, how much revenue they think they're going to get. They will be wrong. Why? Because when the tax rate goes up, people are going to change their behavior. I already gave the example of how they'll change their behavior and go to the politicians and try to bribe them to create more loopholes and preferences and deductions. But you, can, you don't even need to consider that. You can just consider that some people will decide not to work and save and invest as much. Some people will decide, well, 
gee, I've been working very hard. I've been working 60 hours a week trying to create my small business, and, but maybe it's just not worth it because the government's taking more money. Or maybe some people will decide, okay, I've been working very hard, but, and I've been very honest with the tax, uh, my tax forms, but maybe I'm not going to declare as much income to the government. I'm going to figure out some ways uh, to put some of it under the table. All these things begin to happen. There's all, all sorts of different factors that all begin to combine so that the government, they increase the tax rate this much, they think the revenues will go up this much, but maybe the revenues only go up this much, or maybe only this much, or in some cases, the revenues actually go down. And I gave you the example in the U.S. about how the, the lower tax rates actually collected more money. Uh, and, and this type of Laffer curve analysis uh, the IMF doesn't understand it. The European Commission doesn't understand it. Most Treasury Departments and Finance Ministries all around the world don't understand it. And keep in mind, the most important thing about it, it's not just that you're going to maybe have less revenue than you think you're going to have next year, but you're also affecting that long-run rate of economic growth. Remember, 1% economic growth Italy, 70 years to double your GDP, 7% economic growth in some place like Hong Kong, 10 years to double your GDP. Which direction do you want to be moving in? Do you want to be moving in the direction of Italian growth, or do you want to be moving in the direction of Estonian or Hong Kong type growth? That's really what this issue is all about. Let me go ahead and talk about the big obstacle in the U.S. And how am I doing on time? Uh, you still have time. Okay. okay. Uh, when I start talking, I lose track of what, uh, and then, of course, it's getting dark out. Everyone wants to leave. Um, since I, you know, but this is important stuff. Uh, in the United States, the biggest argument that we have to deal with publicly on the flat tax is what we call the fairness or the, or the class warfare issue. And this is the idea that oh, the budget is in, in trouble. Uh, shouldn't rich people be the ones who pay? Rich people have more money, so therefore we should tax them at a higher rate. Isn't that the right thing to do? And this, this theory goes all the way back, I guess it was plank number two in the Communist Manifesto back in, what was that, 1840? 48 or something. I, I don't even know, but I, I, I try not to read things like that. Uh, but, you know, the, we've had pro so-called progressive taxation uh, pretty much from the time the income tax first began. Uh, even the very first income tax in the United States in 1913, uh, the basic tax rate was 1%. But the top tax rate was 7%. So even when we first put in our income tax in the U.S. Now, of course, would I love to go back to a, a system with a top tax rate of 7%? <laughs> yes, I would. Um, but, uh, but it sort of just underscores the, uh, the fact that once politicians get that power to tax income, they do like going after rich people with higher tax rates. Uh, they do it for a couple of reasons. First reason probably the first reason, is, uh, is because they have this mistaken understanding that the higher tax rates will automatically give them more revenue. We just discussed why that's sometimes not the case. But then the second reason why they do it, and there's a, there's a lot of evidence from the U.S. political system that this is what happens, but I think it's probably true in other countries as well. In the vast majority of countries, if not all countries, most income is earned by people in the middle. In the U.S., we, we have all these data that, that if, if the government stole every penny people over a million dollars a year were making, it wouldn't eliminate the deficit. It, would, it wouldn't run the government for more than maybe a couple of months. Uh, and obviously, if you steal all the money from rich people in, in the first year, they're not going to earn the money in the second year. So, so it's not even a good long-term policy. Uh, and, and so rich people by themselves are never a way of financing government. The vast majority of money is earned by people in the middle. But if politicians want to tax people in the middle, what do they have to do? They have to somehow get past people's defenses because, you know, Ordinary middle class people don't like paying more to government. But if you're a politician and you're trying to figure out, well, how can we tax all these people in the middle? Well, the first thing you do is say, we're going to tax the rich people. And then you put in the high taxes on the rich people, 
And then, of course, when that doesn't solve the problem, because there aren't enough rich people, and you wind up not getting the revenue that you think you're going to get, then the politicians can come back and say, okay, we taxed the rich people, that didn't work, now we have to tax the middle class. And that's what we've seen in America and in other countries that I've looked at closely, like England, that's what we've seen in England. The politicians increase the taxes on the rich, that doesn't solve the problem, and then they come back and increase the taxes on the middle class. And that's one of the reasons, this is what's called the public choice analysis, sort of thinking about you know, how are the incentives of politicians different than the incentives of taxpayers. Uh, and this is one of, the, one of the ways and one of the reasons why I think that higher taxes on the rich almost always are a precursor or a predictor of higher taxes on the middle class. If governments decide that they don't want to control spending, and they decide that they want to extract more revenue from the productive sector of the economy, they're going to use the fairness argument as a, as a political weapon, a political weapon that enables them to, to, to lull the middle class into complacency, into thinking, okay, well, I guess everyone's had to sacrifice. And, and, and well, let me give you a European example, because I think this makes it clear. Uh, Forty years ago, when the European economies began to put in the value-added taxes, uh, there was always a lot of discussion about, okay, well, we're going to be taxing the middle class and poor people with the value-added tax, uh, but we're going to increase tax rates on the rich to sort of balance everything out. But if you look at tax revenues as a share of GDP, and you look at it over all the industrialized countries, like the OECD countries, what do you see? The U.S. and Europe both tax rich people about the same in terms of you know, the effective tax rates uh, on, uh, on income from the rich. The difference between the U.S. and Europe, the reason government is bigger in Europe than it is in the United States is because Europe taxes middle class and poor people at a higher rate. That's the difference. The Europeans have learned, they, I doubt the politicians would ever admit this publicly, but European politicians in different nations have learned that you can't squeeze more money out of rich people because they move or their investments move or they don't work as hard, all the things we've already discussed. And so my concern is that we're going to see in the Czech Republic, if they increase the tax rate on the flat tax, they're going to find out that doesn't work. They probably even already know it's not going to work, but then they can come back and increase the value-added tax, or they can increase the basic income tax rate, or they're going to put in higher excise taxes. You know, politicians are ingenious when it comes to uh, developing different ways to raise taxes. But again, the higher tax rates on the rich are sort of the necessary step one. You know, we have a saying in America, our journey of a thousand miles begins with a first step. Well, this is a journey to higher taxes on everybody, and it begins with a first step, and that first step is higher taxes on the rich. And that's one of the reasons why the, the flat tax is so important. As a matter of fact, I want to give you an example from one of the U.S. states, Massachusetts. Massachusetts is sort of normally considered a, a very left-wing state in America. Uh, it, it was the state that gave us Ted Kennedy. It was the state that gave us John Kerry. Uh, so normally, it's a very left-wing state, but because of their state constitution, they have a flat tax. Four different times, and by the way, like in Switzerland, to, uh, to change the constitution, you have to have a vote of the people. So four different times in Massachusetts, the, uh, the, the, the big government people have put a referendum on the ballot and asked people to vote to get rid of the flat tax. And the most recent time they tried it, back in 1994, they even designed the tax plan so that they could tell people that we're going to raise taxes on the richest 10%, but then we're going to cut taxes on everyone else. So 90% of people were supposed to get a tax cut, 10% of people were supposed to get a tax increase. That was their argument. Hey, vote against the flat tax, vote to give the politicians the power to put in a progressive tax, and 90% of you is sort of like saying, okay, these three people over here, we're going to raise taxes on them, but everyone else in the room is going to get a tax cut. So who's in favor of this new plan? And, and they hoped, they hoped that all the other people in the room, the 90% were going to raise their hand or go to the voting booth and vote for this new tax plan. 
What happened? 68% of people in Massachusetts voted no. Why? Because they understood something that I hope the people of the Czech Republic understand. Once you give the politicians the ability to tax one person at a higher tax rate, it's just a matter of time before those politicians will tax everybody at a higher tax rate. That's what we have seen in U.S. history. That's what we've seen in European history. That's what we've seen in different states. The politicians in Massachusetts can't raise the flat rate on everybody because then they get everybody upset at them. That's why they wanted to try this, this uh, special referendum. They thought they could trick the people of Massachusetts. They thought they could put in a plan that only raised taxes on 10% and they could convince the 90% that it was okay. But I give the people of Massachusetts credit. They realized the politicians were doing what we call a bait and switch. A bait and switch is like you tell someone, here, give me this money, I'm going to give you this brand new expensive car. And then after you get all the money, you give them some old piece of junk. And that's what a bait and switch is. Well, that's what happens with politicians when they try to get rid of a flat tax. That's what happens with politicians when they try to raise a tax rate. Uh, and I think that, that lesson from Massachusetts, it, it's probably the most important thing uh, that I can get across in this kind of discussion. Uh, and I suppose, let, let, let me now sort of conclude by coming back to a, uh, to a general principle of fiscal policy, and then hopefully we can have some good, uh, some good discussion. And I hope actually some spirited discussion. I hope there are some people who disagree so we can really begin to try to, uh, to, uh, to identify and determine the issues that are very important, you know, where the key differences are. But I want to come back to this general issue of fiscal policy uh, in the context of what's been happening in Europe in the last three to four years. Because I already mentioned that, uh, that there's this Maastricht criteria where you're supposed to have deficits of 3% of GDP or below and government debt of 60% of GDP or below. And that obviously didn't work. And so what's happening now? Well, you know, Merkel and some of the others are saying, well, we need to have a Maastricht treaty, but we need to give it some steroids. You know what steroids are? Like people in the gym, you know, they, they take these... Uh, illegal medicines to make themselves bigger, sort of Arnold Schwarzenegger thing. Um, well, let's have the Maastricht uh, criteria, but we'll give it some steroids, so now instead of 3% uh, of GDP for deficits, it'll be one half of 1%. Why is that going to work any better? If nobody was paying attention to the 3% to of GDP, why are they going to pay attention to the half percent of GDP? Ah, but if you listen to Angela Merkel, she says it's because we're going to have penalties. Well, how likely is it the economy's in a recession, so tax revenues aren't coming in, more people are wanting to claim unemployment benefits, so deficits are going up, there's all this pressure. How likely is it that the European Commission is actually going to impose a penalty that people are actually going to pay? And of course, how likely is it that, that it will be fair? You know, do, do you really think they're going to treat the Czech Republic the same as they treat Germany or something like that? Of course not. It's going to be, a, it's going to be a ridiculous system that won't work. It won't be enforced fairly. It probably won't be enforced at all. But here's the problem. Whether you're talking about Maastricht or whether you're talking about this new EU fiscal treaty, fiscal constitution, whatever you want to call it, it's based on the wrong understanding. What, what, what is it? Uh, I, I'm not a scientist, but the, uh, remember the old theory of the, of the solar system was, a, I think it was called the geocentric. People used to think that, that everything revolved around the Earth. The sun revolved around the Earth. You know, Venus revolved around the Earth. Everything revolved around the Earth under this old theory when people didn't know any better. Well, this is the way I think of this European uh, fiscal treaty. They assume that everything revolves around deficits and debt. So you have the deficit at the center of the solar system, like people used to think the Earth was at the center of the solar system, and then you know, everything else revolves around that. But no, the important thing to realize is that the deficit is a symptom. The underlying problem, what's really at the center, is the size of government. And this comes back to, the, to that golden rule of good fiscal policy of having the private sector grow faster than the government. That's what 
is it heliocentric, I guess, is the sun at the center of the solar system? I'm not even sure. But what should be at the center of the solar system with a proper understanding of fiscal policy is the size of government. Because it's the size of government that determines everything. If the size of government is big, your taxes are going to be high. If the size of government is big, your deficits are going to be high. If the size of government is big, your economy is going to grow slower. So everything if we want to properly understand fiscal policy, we need to put the size of government at the center of the solar system, but the European Commission and the IMF, they have this sort of, I think it's Copernicus uh, was the guy who had this wrong definition of the solar system. Well, that's what the EU and the IMF have. They have this wrong definition of the fiscal solar system. They put government borrowing at the center, and then everything else orbits around that. That's wrong. And one of the reasons that we're getting this pressure uh, to have bad tax policy not just in the Czech Republic, there's pressure all over the world for bad tax policy. And that pressure for bad tax policy is driven by the fact that countries and politicians and bureaucrats and even people in the business community sometimes, they don't understand what the real problem is. The real problem is government that's too big, not the fact that some of that government is being financed by borrowing. Yes, it's not good to have government borrowing, but it's not good to have high taxes either. So if you want to keep government borrowing down and you want to keep your tax system friendly to growth, because believe me, you much rather would have Hong Kong growth than Italian growth. And what's the difference between Hong Kong growth and Italian growth? Well, as I said at the very beginning of my remarks, there are lots of reasons. But I think one of the reasons is that Hong Kong has a small government with a flat tax and Italy has a big government with a tax system that has special penalties on people who create more wealth and create more jobs. And that is not a very good idea. And with that, uh, I'll stop and uh, be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the floor is indeed open for questions. We have a microphone there, so uh, please ask your questions and always please introduce yourself. Okay. And as always, our dear guest. <laughs> Expect a left wing criticism. <laughs> My name is Sedlak, S E D L A K. I even lectured at the Columbia University in the 90s. A professor, by the way, just a few weeks ago, there in your place were sitting representatives of Scandinavian countries. You know very well that something like flat tax is for them a stupid idea. Secondly, you know very well that after the 1945, the, uh, the period, period after this year, in the United States was relatively very successful economically. Up to, say, middle of 60s. As you well know, very well know, at that time, the taxation of rich people was 90%, Professor. 90%. Later on, Kennedy, uh, it went down, and of course, Reagan. Thirdly, if I may, okay, thank Lastly. you. Lastly. Uh, I think that um, if you wish or not, uh, the next president in Paris will be François Hollande, and uh, according to me. and. Uh, his idea, he is ready, not only he, but I mean people around him, to export the ideas to the whole Europe and together with the Scandinavian governments to export it to the United States. Uh, are you aware that the uh, world is, I mean West, Western world, is becoming rich for ideas to do something with taxation and uh, this Gini index, etc., you know very well all these things. Uh, is, that's the proof that uh, the mankind and West, especially, deserve better world, and it cannot have it with 
flat taxation. Thank you. All right, I'll, I'll try to remember all those questions. Uh, uh, first one was about uh, the Scandinavian countries. And uh, I gather the premise is that by European standards, they're doing pretty well and they have very high tax rates. Uh, and you're right. The Scandinavian countries, on average, grow faster than the uh, European countries to the south of them. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why I mentioned the Economic Freedom of the World Index from the Fraser Institute. Because if you look at that index, you will find that the Scandinavian countries get very bad scores, but they get the highest scores in the world just about on the other 80% of, of, uh, of the variables. Uh, they are, you know, Denmark and Sweden especially are, are extremely laissez-faire, hyper-free market on all these other measures like rule of law, property rights, regulation, trade, monetary policy. Uh, and, and I didn't include it in this speech, but a lot of times when I'm speaking around the world, I give people the example of, and actually I did mention Ukraine already, I give people the example would you rather invest money in Ukraine, it has a low 15% flat tax, or would you rather invest money in Sweden, where the top tax rate I think is 56 or 57%? Well, if all you were looking at was taxes, you would say, oh, I'm going to invest money in Ukraine. But if you look at all the different economic policies, Ukraine is very economically repressed, very statist, and Sweden is very free market. So even though the government's going to take you know, half of what you make, in, in, at least on the individual income side, on the, on the corporate tax side, they're 28 percent, so they're a lot more reasonable. But you, you have to look at all these different measures. And that's the same thing that applies for the U.S. Yes, we had 90 percent tax rates after World War II. The government wasn't collecting any money from those taxes. Uh, that's one of the things we found out. When Kennedy cut tax rates, the rich paid more. When Reagan cut tax rates, the rich paid more. But at least when we had those 90% tax rates, other variables in the U.S. economy, like that's when we were moving from, from protectionism, the U.S. was very, very bad in the 1930s with the Smoot-Hawley tariff that really helped trigger a lot of the protectionism around the world. Well, after World War II, we had all this, these series of trade liberalization. So while tax policy was bad, we were doing things like on the trade side that were moving policy in the right direction. So overall, Overall, we were becoming a more free market oriented economy. And that's why I wanted to stress in the beginning of my remarks, don't just look at tax policy, look at fiscal policy. Don't just look at fiscal policy, look at the entire uh, array of public policy choices. So what I would argue is that, yes, the Scandinavian countries are doing very well, but the Scandinavian countries would do even better if they had a friendlier tax system. The U.S. was doing pretty well after World War II, but we would have done even better. Uh, and actually, we did do even better uh, when uh, Kennedy and Reagan uh, cut tax rates. And then I guess your third question was about what's happening in France. Uh, well, actually, just a couple of days ago on my blog, uh, I endorsed Mr. Hollande. Why? Not, not like I, probably not that many people in France read my blog. But I thought Sarkozy is such a statist, such a big government supporter, such a tax increaser. I said, if you're going to have a big government guy who likes to raise taxes, you might as well have him be an honest socialist than someone who pretends to be conservative but is really a socialist too. So, uh, so as far as I'm concerned, you know, this is the same reason I was in favor of Jimmy Carter over Gerald Ford in 1976. They were both big government guys, but at least if you elected Jimmy Carter, that created a chance for there to be Ronald Reagan. So I don't know whether France has any hope at all. There's probably never been a Ronald Reagan ever since Bastiat died, uh, you know, 150 years ago or whenever. Uh, but, uh, but no, I, I don't, France is in deep trouble. Uh, you know, when you talk about the debt dominoes, uh, you know, we've already had, you know, Ireland and, and uh, Greece and Portugal and now Spain. I think France and Belgium are next on the list. I think they're in very deep trouble. I think France and Belgium, like the southern European economies, are examples of what happens when government gets too big and taxes get too high. And, 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 and I say that as someone who thinks that the U.S. is one of those dominoes as well. Uh, Twenty years from now, we're going to be in the same mess because we're making the same mistakes. Other questions? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Welcome to Czech Republic. Uh, I'm glad to hear you here. 
Um, I would like to express my hope that Cato uh, expansion of the new headquarters is going well, I hope. And, uh, but uh, my question is, um, I would like to you to elaborate more about the Saving the American Dream plan of the Heritage Institute, if you could somehow, because it includes the uh, uh, tax reform, uh, the, the reform of the tax system. So if you could uh, elaborate more about it, is it a viable option? Uh, do you support it? Do you think it's a good idea or something like that? Thank you. Uh, the question is about, uh, there's a, I'm at the Cato Institute, but one of the other big think tanks in America is the Heritage Foundation, where I actually worked for uh, 17 years. Uh, so I'm very familiar with the Saving the American Dream Act. Uh, it's not, I don't think it's perfect. I think they do make some decisions that I don't like. Uh, they don't reform the social security system toward personal retirement accounts. Uh, they don't have a flat tax and the proper definition. But, you know, if somebody's going 80% of the way in the right direction, I'm happy. So, so I, I like a lot of what's in the heritage plan, even though I would design it differently. But you know what? It doesn't really matter. Because what really matters is what the politicians on Capitol Hill are doing. And the, the, the one plan that is worth looking at, because it's the one plan that's serious, is the plan by Congressman Paul Ryan, the chairman of the House Budget Committee. And, uh, and that is a very good plan. Uh, because we have th three big entitlement programs. And for those of you who don't, entitlement programs are, are programs that government does that are on autopilot. They just grow automatically. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm worried America will become Greece in 20 years, as I just said, is because we have an aging population and we have these entitlement programs. Medicare, which is health care for old people. Medicaid, which is health care for poor people. And Social Security, which is pensions for old people. Uh, those three programs are going to explode and America will become Greece. Paul Ryan's budget plan fixes not, again, not as perfectly as we would like at the Cato Institute. We're in the world of pure libertarian theory. And we try to educate politicians about it. But I think, you know, if you look at what the Cato Institute has been saying about Medicare and Medicaid, it's very obvious that Paul Ryan and people like that have been reading and paying attention to what we've been saying because his health care reforms and Medicare and Medicaid incorporate the Cato analysis. Uh, not all the way, of course, but in a very substantial way. And so it's the Paul Ryan plan that really would be the thing to focus on because that's, that's what's real. What, what, what we do on the think tanks in America, we write, we give speeches, we go on TV, we meet with politicians, we try to educate people. And we come up with our own plans sometimes, but we come up with our own plans as almost an educational device. Uh, the question then is, what can we get politicians to do? How aggressive can we make them? Like, you know, you know years and years ago, before, when Ronald Reagan was coming into power, people like the Cato Institute were saying flat tax. Well, Reagan didn't do that, but he did reduce tax rates from 70 down to 28, so it was a lot of progress. So, so the Paul Ryan budget plan, that's the real thing. Um, and I suppose it depends on the upcoming U.S. elections. Uh, will Republicans win control of the Senate? I think yes. Will, uh, will they win the White House? Mm, probably not. So we probably have another four years where nothing really happens. Uh, but maybe they will win the White House. And then the question becomes, will Romney do the Ryan plan? Mm, Ryan's, uh, I mean, he's, uh, He's not a very strong free market conservative type, so I'm not sure what he would do. But if he does win and he does do the plan, then maybe we can begin to get those reforms sooner. But if Obama wins, which is probably what, you know, if you look at the political betting sites like intrade.com, they think Obama's going to win, then we'd have to wait at least four more years. And maybe we'll never get the reforms and we'll become Greece which isn't very good. Uh, then, then I'm going to hope that the Czech Republic keeps the flat tax so I can move here and escape uh, the chaos in America. Other questions? Um, hi. Um, I want to ask you, um, where is the problem why poor people don't understand that um, this is better for them. How to communicate it? Because uh, all the clearly right side parties knows that they are right, 
but um, they usually failed on the communication. Well, that, that's a, the question is, you know, why don't lower income people understand that it's good to have these policies that give more economic growth? Um, if I knew the answer to that question, we'd be trying to do it in the U.S. I actually, I actually think I know part of the answer. Um, I don't know what the political parties do in the U.S., but I know what the Republicans do in the U.S. I mean, I don't know what political parties do elsewhere, but I know what the Republicans do in the U.S. They don't, they don't try. I think if Republicans, or if, you know, I guess what, the, the ODS is your conservative party here, or, you know, it's, it's actually, if you're an American, you know, a free market party in Europe is a liberal party, and of course liberal in the U.S. means you're a statist, a socialist, so, but okay, if you're a liberal or free market conservative type here in Europe, uh, I, I, you know, maybe they do this, but I know that Republicans in the U.S. don't. Republicans in the U.S., if they took extra effort to go to poor communities uh, and explain the importance of economic growth, uh, I think they would probably get a lot of votes. Uh, especially when you think about, like, in America, a lot of the poor people are, are minorities, black and Hispanic. There are all sorts of policies, like school choice, because if you're a poor person in the U.S., the chances are you're in a place where the government monopoly schools are terrible. And so your children are condemned to a very bad education because the government monopoly school system is going to do a terrible job. Well, Republicans, I think, are idiots because they should be going to these poor communities uh, uh, with, with black and Hispanic families that don't want to be on welfare all their lives. They would like their children to have a better life, but their children are stru stuck in a poor school system. Why? Because the teacher unions are so closely allied with the Democratic Party that the Democrats would rather please the teacher unions and they would rather condemn the, the uh, black and Hispanic children to bad education. That gives Republicans a very big opening to go to those poor people, and that's just one example. If they started doing that by talking about tax reform, would you rather have rich people send, invest their money here to create jobs, or would you ra rather have rich people send their money to Washington so the politicians can waste it? You know, so, so I do think there are opportunities, and I don't know whether your conservative and your liberal parties here don't do it. I know Republicans in the U.S. don't do it. They really need to go out and make this case I mean, and ask poor people, okay, you haven't voted Republican in the past. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but I'm going to tell you why you should. I think Republicans should do that. Um, I think your parties, the ODS and other parties on the right, whatever they are, they should do the same thing. That, that's no guarantee of success because some poor people have the wrong mentality. Some poor people think, well, I... All I want is to vote for the party that promises to take as much from somebody else and give to me. But what happens with that sooner or later? Well, sooner or later, if you have so many people riding in the wagon of dependency, uh, look at Greece. When you add together all the people who are getting government welfare, getting government pensions, working for the government, I don't want to say working because they're probably not working, but employed by the government. When you start adding up all those people, they're a majority of the population. So, in the, you know, Greece has elections coming up. What are the chances that Greece is going to fix its problems? 60 percent, 55 percent, whatever it is of the population is riding in the wagon, and then you have this, this minority of people pulling the wagon. Well, the minority of people pulling the wagon probably understand that Greece needs reform. But are you... These people in the wagon, they're, they're going to vote for the parties of big government. And that's going to continue the cycle. Even though, even though, if you're a parasite, you don't want to kill your host animal. If you're a flea or a tick and the dog that you're on dies, that's not good for you. So even the people riding in the wagon should understand that you don't want to tax and spend so much that you destroy the ability of the economy to generate enough revenue to be redistributed to you. This is the point I made about President Lula of Brazil. If nobody's producing, there's no income to redistribute. And, and the Greeks, I think, are past the point of no return. Matter of fact, I think democracy is dead in Greece. Greece is going to be a protectorate, a colony of Berlin and Brussels. Because I just think that 
there's too many people riding in the wagon and they don't understand. So it's not, it's not that they're necessarily poor people, it's, they could be just special interest groups, uh, protected industries, uh, government wor workers, but the point is, is that it's the responsibility of anybody who believes in freedom should try to speak to audiences of lower income people and to try to convince them freedom, entrepreneurship, growth, these are the things that are better for your future, not government dependency. But again, that, that's, that is the fundamental challenge. If, if, if we could figure out how to properly answer your question, uh, I would be much more optimistic about the future of the world. As it is right now, I'm not optimistic. So uh, if, if, if Czech Republic goes the wrong way and the US goes the wrong way, then I guess I'll just have to move to the Cayman Islands. Except I don't have any money, so that's a problem. So yeah, so somebody has to fix their problem so I have some place to go. Other questions? Hi, my name is Dan Chesney. I'm from Prague School of Economics and uh, actually recently Severo Institute too. Um, I got perhaps a follow-up question to the one before and that concerns the idea of, or, or, or that concerns selling the idea of flat tax. And I wonder how you do it in, in the US um, because essentially there are two issues. One is the incentives, and I think there's no doubt, nobody doubts that if you lower the taxes, people are more, people get more incentives to produce. Uh, and I don't see a reason how anybody can deny this. The other issue is uh, the government revenue, and then there it depends on, on the elasticity. Uh, I mean, uh, so my question is, do you sell this idea as something that's going to generate more revenue, just like the supply siders did? Or do you actually admit that it might, that the revenue may go down with the flat tax? I mean, now we have the flat tax and we may go, we may go, uh, we may leave it, but um, essentially this is an important issue because yeah. I think that explains why people, um, why some people may prefer not to have a flat tax because, and this is what the politicians probably claim, they say, we understand, maybe they, they're not saying it explicitly, but they, if, they, if they're pushed very hard, they might say, all right, they, this would lead to growth, but um, we want fairer society, just like we heard before, I mean, we want a better world, and we, want, we don't want the growth for the rich, right? So, um, I think, you, you know, you've, you've did this, you have done this uh, throughout your speech. A couple of times you've, you've referred to the possibility that it will increase, that it may increase the revenue. And I wonder if this is something, you know, how much, how much emphasis you put on this. Yeah, no. Um, well, the whole issue of elasticities and Laffer curve, it's really the same thing. You know, how much additional economic output will you get and how much revenue will that additional output generate and will it make up for the change in the tax rate? Uh, I gave the example during the Reagan years where the tax cut paid for itself. That's the phrase we use in the U.S. Uh, in almost all cases, tax cuts don't pay for themselves. There are a few examples. The low corporate tax rate in Ireland. They used to have a 50% corporate tax rate. It collected 1% of GDP in revenue. They reduced their corporate tax rate to 12.5%. Now it collects 2 to 3% of, of GDP of revenue. And of course, GDP is much bigger. So the Irish government is getting a much bigger slice of a much bigger pie because the tax rate is much lower. When Russia replaced their 30% top rate with a 13% flat tax, you look at what happened to personal income and the revenues from the personal income tax, it increased dramatically. But those are rare exceptions. In most cases, in most cases, when you cut a tax, you will lose revenue, if you're, you know, from the perspective of a politician. But you won't lose as much revenue as the IMF and the European Commission and the Finance Ministry think, because they have a linear mathematical formula. Cut tax rates by 20%, 20% less revenue. That's not true. It might be 15% less revenue, it might be 10% less revenue. You know, that's an empirical question. Uh, when I talk about flat tax to, to politicians around the world, I always stress that it's not a free lunch. A free lunch would be a tax cut that pays for itself. That, that is so rare. I mean, maybe 
30 years ago when countries had 70% top tax rates, and the OECD, the average top tax rate, used to be 67 point something percent. Back then, you did have free lunches. You could reduce tax rates uh, and, and have them pay for themselves because the incentives not to produce and the incentives for tax avoidance and tax evasion were so high when you had tax rates that high. But if you have like a, a 35% tax rate and you lower your tax rate, you're probably losing revenue. Now, there's a question about short-term versus long-term. I mean, if, if you grow, you know, one half of 1% faster and you compound that out over 100 years, you probably are gaining revenue. But of course, you know, nobody thinks 100 years down the road. So yeah, it's, it's an empirical question. Uh, when I talk about tax reform, uh, when I talk about just changes in tax rates more generally, uh, what I try to convince the politicians of well, it's that example I gave earlier in my remarks about it. you run a restaurant, you know if you double your prices, you're not going to sell twice as many, you're not going to get twice the revenue. You're going to sell fewer meals. That's really, I'm just trying to get them to understand that. Because right now, they have this ridiculous position of just the linear mathematical formula. And I, I want them just to understand that's not accurate. Now, once I get them to understand it's not accurate, then I can get them in the empirical debate and discussion, okay, where are your tax rates now? How much are you talking about lowering them or raising them? What are the elast, you know, I assume that there must be people in the Czech Republic who do microeconomic studies about labor supply elasticity, investment elasticity. But remember what I said at the very beginning of my talk. Global competition means that especially investment is very sensitive to differences in tax rates. And the Czech Republic has a decision to make. Are you going to tell the world, we're not a flat tax country anymore, we believe in, in punishing people who create more wealth? That's a very bad signal to send. Uh, and, and if I was actually talking to, to politicians here, that's probably what I would stress. The flat tax is a signaling device. And you don't want to send the wrong signal. Anything else? If I may, one more question. Um, what do you think, uh, what is the possibility that uh, the ideas of uh, Ron Paul or Ryan Paul will take roots in uh, mainstream Republican Party in, uh, say, next two, four years? What is the possibility? Uh, would it be possible only in case some uh, horrible disaster, <laughs> you know, uh, bankruptcy of uh, United States or a whole Europe or something like that or even though I disagree with him on uh, many issues regarding defense and foreign policy for example but still well that's a uh, uh, you obviously follow US politics probably more than most Americans do um, when I give speeches around the US I'm surprised by the amount of Republicans that don't really care about this year's elections because they think Obama's for big government, but they think Romney's for big government too. So they figure, well, who really cares? Sort of the same reason why I don't care if Hollande wins in France. Sarkozy's such a socialist uh, that, that does it really matter. Uh, Republicans had a very weak field of candidates this year. Santorum, Gingrich, Romney, uh, you know, Ron Paul, a lot of people like him, but he's, he's 76 years old and, and he talks about central banking too much. Nobody even knows what that is. Uh, in 2016, Republicans are going to have a very strong field. Rand Paul, Ron Paul's son, who I think is a much better politician, but just as principled. Uh, Senator Rubio of Florida, Chris Christie of New Jersey, uh, Paul Ryan, who I already mentioned, chairman of the House Budget Committee from Wisconsin. It's sort of like, a, I don't know, what's the national sport here? Is it hockey or soccer? Okay, well, okay, so let's say you, you have your big game against the Slovaks in hockey. Well, you might have, I, I don't know how many people are on a, a hockey team, maybe there's 20, but there's only, I guess, six on the ice at any one time. Do you want your six best players on the ice because you want to beat the Slovaks, or do you want to have your six worst players on the ice? For Republicans, it's like they had their worst team in 2012, but they're going to have their best team in 2016. And, you know, sometimes politics just works that way. Sometimes you have good candidates to run. Sometimes you have weak candidates to run. And so a lot of Republicans, 
they view this year's election, oh boy, we got stuck with a, you know, with a bunch of bad candidates. But boy, 2016, they're, they're already excited about it. And maybe Rand Paul, but you know, Marco Rubio is, I think, just about as free market. And Paul Ryan, he has his staff read Atlas Shrugged, at least according to news reports. I don't know if it's actually true. Uh, so yeah, it's a, um, the premise of your question, I think, is uh, the answer is yes, even though the names might be a little bit different. So, uh, but I guess with that, that any last questions? Um, all right, well, let me give just one quick commercial. Uh, the Cato Institute, cato.org, very simple. And I have my blog, International Liberty. Just go to Google, type in Dan Mitchell blog, you'll get to it. Uh, and uh, other than that, I'm sure that I'll be staying here uh, to answer any questions uh, afterwards. Oh, here we go. No, 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 let's, one do, last it. Question. let's do it informally. Let's do it informally. Yes. This was a very nice closing of our event. Okay. And we'll be around talking, debating for maybe an extra 30 minutes or something, but uh, I want to close the official part of the meeting. Thank you for coming to Severo Institute and please keep coming back. Mr. Thank Schindler, you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Sir. I just wish to ask you whether you are aware when you come next year here to this country, we can have quite different political systems.